so blessed just to be in her presence and your presence and we're all receiving presents. <laughs> uh, so we good. We're just like always receiving your, your grace and your love and your mercy, whether we know it or not, whether we feel it or, or not, it's always there. So help us remind, help me remember that as I go out throughout my day and throughout this interview, especially I ask for your angels and hedge of protection over all. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right. So Mimi, yeah. I can't wait to hear about your book but I'm going to have you wait a little bit because I want you to introduce yourself and just tell me about yourself, not the book, but just tell me about who you are and how you came to experience life in the Kainos revelation, sort of like knowing who you are in Christ, your identity. And what does it matter? Why does that even matter? Why right. can't we just go ahead and say, be Christian and just move on with our life? What is making all things new mean to you? You know, that new creation, whatever the Holy Spirit brings to you, please share with us. Yeah, yeah. You're so, always got words of wisdom. <laughs> the whole identity thing. So I've been doing some form of ministry for 35 years. And um, the most important issue I find with listening to people's stories, what they deal with, what they struggle with, whether they come from the ecstatic, finished works tribe of the body of Christ or super, super conservative Baptist, or whether they don't know God yet, identity is the issue. So I've seen people that have had multiple, multiple, multiple ecstatic supernatural experiences, but still don't know how to do life, still don't love themselves, still don't know that they're loved by Abba, daddy, that they're his favorite. And then people that, you know, have degrees from seminary and they're actually leaders in the body of Christ. And the same thing, they're not sure of their identity, they're insecure in their belovedness. So going all the way back to my story, just I won't try to make it too long, but the pivotal point was September 7th, 1985, I went to bed, a cocaine addicted atheist new ager. And the next morning, Sunday morning, a voice woke me up out of a dead sleep. And so I go to church. And there was nobody there visibly. And I woke up and I went, I don't go to church. And I rolled back over to go to sleep because I didn't go to church. And this power pulled me up to a sitting position in my bed. When that happened, I was fully awake and Papa God revealed himself. And I went to this little tiny church in Natick, Massachusetts, the only one I knew of at the time hungover, wasted still, mascara on my face, didn't shower, anything, just dragged myself into this place, sat on the third row on the right-hand side and went into a vision. I didn't know what any of this stuff was because I, yes. Come as you are. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I didn't know anything. I mean, I was just being like literally pulled and I had a, an experience of Jesus on the cross but not beaten up and bloodied. He was beautiful, amber, gold, glory. And he said, and I'm weeping uncontrollably. I just not, I don't even know what's going on because I'm an atheist. I don't know anything about anything. No church history. Um, went to Sunday school a little bit when I was a kid, but I was an atheist from age 12, a determined, consciously chosen atheist and argued on the side of evolution and all that stuff in debates. He said, Mimi, I've exchanged all of your garbage for all of my glory. Just like that, like just like the hands. And I was never the since. That's never the same since. That was September 8th, 1985. Now here's the cool thing. This took place, started in my bedroom, nobody there. That's why I love to tell my story because nobody was witnessing to me. Nobody was talking to me about the Bible or Jesus or Holy Spirit or anything like that. This was a supernatural encounter. I wasn't seeking God. I was looking for love in all the wrong places. And I was experimenting with everything but Jesus. I wanted nothing to do with what I saw Christianity to be or Jesus. So anytime somebody wow. came at me with that, I totally rejected it. Wow. Tore them up one side down the other. I wasn't looking for him wow it's like you were, it's like you were removing the weeds in your mind before you knew you were removing them 
I wasn't doing anything. I was a mess. Right. God, but God, God, he did it all. He showed up, he spoke, he revealed, he manifested. And from that day on, I was completely transformed. Mm -hmm. Now that the little church I went to, here's the interesting thing, back to identity. Little Baptist, fundamental Baptist church, like hardcore fundamental Baptist, no tongues, no supernatural. They were total cessationists, right? Mm -hmm. But that pastor, that beloved pastor, I'm not going to say his name, but I, if he is still alive, he watches this, he knows who he is. He gave me a, a sheet. It said 27 scriptures about your new identity in Christ. Okay. From the get-go, I was getting uh, renewed in my mind and my being. So right at, early on, God showed me that I was a princess, that I was royalty, that I was part of his royal family, that his royal blood was in me. And all those things I was doing before were beneath me. Mm -hmm. They were beneath my true identity. So it took another like 10 months or so before I stopped using drugs and Doing. As a matter of fact, the day that I had that encounter with God, I went to my guy, the main guy I was dating at the time. I was dating a bunch of different people, but the main guy. And I said, guess what happened to me? And I told him about my experience. He said, well, let's celebrate. And we did like a gram of Coke and some other things. And I was like, oh, it doesn't feel the same. From the very beginning, nobody even told me about sin. I didn't even know what sin was. I just was like, it doesn't feel the same. It doesn't feel as pleasurable. I don't feel condemned, but it's not satisfying. And then we go on to, I mean, God was already from the very beginning transforming my identity, 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 identity. And I've been in 35 years my average time in any particular congregation is about five years. So um, in different forms, Baptist Church in Boston, the Vineyard in Framingham, other like non-denominational charismatic places. And I've ministered all across the board from super, super conservative to the wildest fringy, you know, pioneer, and then in new age settings and, and with people that don't believe. And I'm not, I've, I've just come down to this conclusion that it is absolutely identity. It's not the supernatural, although that bring it on all the supernatural, all of that stuff. It's do you know the identity of your Abba, his true nature, his true character, the true nature and character of Jesus and Holy Spirit. And in turn, do you know your true identity which is based on their identity. When people know the true nature and character of, of Papa and what love really is and how beloved they are, everything transforms in their life when they know it and they know their identity. So, yeah. That's so good. I have so much to say on that, but the one thing Holy Spirit wants to say is just focusing on that one piece that, that you said, um, when it comes to who we think we are, and that, again, I'm, I'm going to be talking about identity, but um, for me, if I knew that back then, uh, I probably would have never fell so many times uh, into the religious spirit. Um, there were so many denominations that I got lost and sidetracked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not saying I have regrets because I don't, I know it all brought me here for a reason and it, it was to strengthen me and not to say that I might fall again into something that is not where our father wants me to be, but I know exactly how to get back. And it's not like this ritual thing. So I love how you said identity because I, I, I've been talking to people and someone will share their, you know, almost like a formula. And I, I will start to like judge, well, isn't that a formula in my head? But then God in Christ in me says, no, that's, that's her formula I gave to her, leave it alone, you know? Mm -hmm. So sort of like backing up and knowing that, like you said, the evangelical didn't rescue you, you got rescued and not to say that actually ever happens anyway, but you know, you didn't have an outside person speak, preaching the gospel, which is so refreshing to people who wonder you know, maybe I missed my chance when that evangelical was trying to get me into believing in Jesus. You know, that doubt. I know I was there at one point. 
And I thought that you had to do something to become a Christian. You know, I thought the sinner's prayer was in the Bible. It's not. So I just really like what you're, what you were sharing about that. I think it's important for teens. And I mean, you've already answered so much, but I, I don't want to interrupt you too much because you're on such a flow. So just keep <laughs> going with it. Just whatever bothers yeah. you, just, just go. So the, the whole experience and encounter with God was all initiated by God and brought to its conclusion by God. But here's the piece I think is, is important. Um, I found out later that my roommate at the time, now she had um, decided to come back come back to Jesus. I didn't know what any of that meant. And I didn't care. I, I really wanted nothing to do with it. And, uh, but what she had done was six months before I had this encounter, she and this little Baptist church started praying for me every Thursday night at their prayer meeting. So I want to say this about that. I had a Pentecostal golfer uncle on the West Coast and a charismatic Catholic grandmother on the East Coast apparently praying for me off and on over the course of 10 years from the time, because I remember, so my, my uncle Joe, um, who's a well-known, internationally known golf master golf pro, so if I used his name, it would be okay, because he's a public figure. When I was 12 years old, I had such a crush on him. He's handsome and, you know, much, much older, and I just, just thought he was like a movie star. When I was 12 years old, I was already an atheist, and he took me out to McDonald's, just the two of us. And I was like, this is such a rare occasion because he lived far away. And I just thought he was an amazing person, you know, and he'd been in Vietnam and was uh, on the golf tour, like PGA kind of thing. I think at that point, maybe not. Anyway, he took me to McDonald's to tell me about Jesus when I was 12. And I was like, what the heck happened to you in Vietnam? Your cheese has slid off your cracker. You've lost your mind. But he prayed for me until, you know, 10 or more years later when I was in my 20s, I had this supernatural encounter with God. And then I found out my charismatic grandmother, traditional New England Catholic, in the bathroom at Raytheon, which is where she worked, a big defense contractor in the 1970s, suddenly started speaking in tongues. I didn't know any of that. I found that out later. So the both of them were praying in this little church for six months. Every Thursday night, they had me on their hit list. So I want to say this about that. The encounter was completely initiated by God. Would it have happened if they weren't praying for me? Maybe. I don't know. Probably. Could be. But there is something about intention and releasing. And that's one of my books is about this sort of thing. The prayers of the righteous, the ones that love you, they availeth much, they produce something. And their love, uh, maybe I wouldn't have been as receptive another time, I don't know, can't predict any of that. But I do know, I found out later, people were praying for me. And this little church had me targeted for six months, every Thursday night, praying, praying, praying that I would come to know Jesus. and. And I did. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's. Can you please clarify that a little bit? If you just said hit list, you know, what yeah. does it mean? What are they? Doing? Well, that's just my term. Like their 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 prayer hit list. Like they had an actual list of people they were praying for. Their intention was good. They oh were, yeah, not bad. I just just, just the way I talk. You know, just just, just, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no. They wanted me to know Jesus. They my because my roommate lived with me and she knew she knew how I was living my life and all that and she knew that I had no relationship with God. The only relationship I had with God was when I did too much drugs and I thought I was going to die on a few different occasions. I cried out to a God I didn't believe in and made promises I never intended to keep just saying, don't let me die. You know, uh, I would be by myself, um, maybe late at night after a party or something like that, or I'd just be on a bender. You know, I'd get an eight ball of Coke and I would do the whole thing over the course of three or four days by myself. So um, that fear anyway. kept you going though, right? That was the fear of the Lord right there. And you you said, don't let me die. And he did it. Yeah. You he know, what die. an amazing, graceful God we have. Yeah. And I made promises like, I'll, I'll find out who you are, whatever, you know, and I never followed through. So that's the grace of God too. He knows that we're probably not going to keep most of our promises. And his 
love for us, his covenant to us doesn't depend on any of that. If it did, we're all in deep, you know what? Because, Amen. you know, it's just like, we can't, we can't do it. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us right. in relationship, in intimate, union. conscious union and being conscious of that union, mm -hmm. right? And receiving the benefits of that union. Mm -hmm. Whoa, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> but if left to our own devices, we're just like, uh, you know, wandering around again without knowing the true identity of the Trinity. Papa, Son, Holy Spirit, we can't know our own identity. We don't know how to live. We don't know how to function because everything that we're created to do flows from the Trinity. Mm, and so, in that union, <laughs> in the bosom of the Trinity, mm. is where we find life. Mm. and we're already there we just don't all know it mm. so when we have that conscious i had a real awakening mm. feels good I, to smell the flowers though right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> just to stop i mean i was just thinking of like in my mind i was just yeah. imagining a toddler chasing a butterfly and just mm. that god created that that whole sequence where almost everybody that's had a child, I'm sure has chased a butterfly or something of that nature, <laughs> right? You know, just that, yeah. in, that intrinsic curiosity that we have to just explore. And, and that butterfly is also a symbol of our transformation. But right. if we like start worshiping that, that butterfly, <laughs> then what does that do to our hearts? You know, it doesn't separate us from God, but he does harden hearts and he softens hearts. So there's a time and season, right? For yeah. 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 And you can't go through, so the, the butterfly doesn't make itself go through metamorphosis. An outside force and the design of the, of the creature causes it to be a caterpillar and then go into the cocoon and then, you know, completely liquefy and transform into something that never existed before. So I like, you know, you're talking about the little child chasing the butterfly. The thing that came to mind, maybe not so much for little boys, and maybe it's changing because, you know, so many of the messages are changing in society, at least in America. But most little girls, at least in my generation, we grew up with the image or the idea of a knight in shining armor coming to rescue us. And a little boy, you know, a hero. So that's where the comics come from, Superman. Um, I'm in a place right now where there's Superman stuff all over the place because it's very symbolic. But we have this longing to be rescued, this longing to be cherished, to be scooped up and passionately loved, taken care of, or like for a little boy, it could be little girls too, hero worship, you know, someone that's greater than everything that's going on. And that's, uh, I write a little bit about that in different things that that's kind of in our DNA in some ways that wanting to the knight in shining armor and in natural relationships that typically never happens but the knight in shining armor is jesus and the superman the true superman is jesus yeshua, yeshua. and that's why that longing is inside of us for someone greater than us mm -hmm. to scoop us up and just say Oh my God, you are the delight of my heart and the apple of my eye. And I bought the whole field, Anissa, yes. just to get you, just to get you. We, we've been taught, many people have been taught that Jesus is the pearl of great price. In reality, you are the pearl of great price. Anybody watching this? And he gave everything to let us know that that his love, you know, that he loves us so passionately. I can't even describe it. No, it gets you weepy. I'm like, oh, holy spirit. Well, look me, I get hammered drunk. Yeah. <laughs> that too. <laughs> I hope I can do this. Can My endorphins start going. <laughs> I know. I know. There, no, there is a, a physical response. And you mentioned that a lot in your book. Um, oh, I, I focus on it very much. Yeah, yeah. I just want to 
I just want to make sure we make the best of this time. So um, will you tell us a little bit about your book and what you're doing next? Yeah, yeah. So I have both books here. The first one um, I released on Mother's Day. And I'm going to hold it up. And I actually put my email, I don't know if they'll be able to see it, but I put my email address in my name, actually. Well, for, I'll share that. So it's, yeah, so that's the contact. So she has her copy. Oh, you have the proof. You have the proof. Yeah. No, Woo. This copy, this is going down in history. <laughs> <laughs> so it has a really funny name. And um, it's called the Binge Visioning Technique, which nobody had heard be of before 2016. And then the subtitle is when you want to manifest a glorious life. And I put mana as M-A-N-N-A -N -N -A, and I'll explain to you why. Um, and then this is the second one that I just did. This is you don't have to white knuckle it. The recovering addicts toolkit ways to feel high right now without wrecking your life. And both of those books are available either directly from me or on Amazon. So the binge visioning technique. So for 20, I don't know, let's see, up to 2016, I've been on this journey of um, the Lord spoken many different things to me from the very beginning. He told me there was a coming renaissance that would be born of the spirit 35 years ago. He told me that everything that could be changed was going to be changed the way we did literature, relationships, business, finances, worship everything was going to be completely changed um and he's given me many 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 dreams and revelations over the 35 years about the season that we're in right now i see it all over the place so along with that i've had this fascination with how do we function and why so when I, I got into ministry really early on I got pulled into a musical theater group that was a, a Christian musical theater group and then into a ministry for people coming out of the gay lifestyle I was a prayer counselor for that in Boston and just a lot of different experiences from the very beginning a very diverse uh, list of experiences and I was looking at common denominators of what effectually changes a person's life. It wasn't just knowing Jesus. I know a lot of people who know Jesus, well, maybe not really know, know Jesus, like they have a relationship, but still massively struggle with depression, anger, addiction, all kinds of stuff. That's not a judgment. That's just uh, my observation. So because God, Papa's so good, and he says, if you lack wisdom, ask me for it, and I'll give it to you. So I've always had this very, it's a very Jewish relationship with my Abba, and with Jesus, and with Holy Spirit. I'm constantly asking questions. Why does this happen this way? Why don't I see the results? Why do people go to an ecstatic, drunk in the spirit experience for three days, and have these amazing encounters with you, God? and then are still struggling with the same things they were struggling with before. Why do we lay hands on the sick and not see them recover? Why, you know, why, 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 why? Why are so many people, um, um, what is it about religious structure that sucks people out of freedom back into structure that binds them up? Beautiful way of putting it, by the way. Go ahead, continue. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I would have said brainwashing, but okay, that was much better. Yeah, well, brainwashing is a good, it's it's a thing. It's a real thing. So, there, but there's judgment about what that means. And it's a whole other, that was beautiful. Thanks. Thanks. So I am um, in the process of asking a lot of these questions. Holy Spirit is so good to always answer and give me revelation, either by leading me to resources like Dr. Caroline Leaf, Dr. Daniel Amen, um, my own studies, my own experiences through scripture, a whole combination of factors. And about 20 years ago, like I started getting really drunk in the spirit, intoxicated, ecstasis, anybody who doesn't know what that is, all the endorphins firing throughout my being, my brain, like, I don't know if your dad or mom ever did the egg cracking head where you go like that and you go, Shh, 
and you feel all tingly through your head and your body and you're like, Ooh, well, it's like that. And it's love that started happening to me, uh, in 1987 and has never stopped, never stopped experiencing the intoxication of the Lord and his bliss and his love. Now I said to the Holy Spirit one day, I was like, okay, I know that not everybody's wired the way that I am, but you say in your word that the joy of the Lord is our strength. You're no respecter of persons. I put all these pieces together. So teach me how to get your bliss to as many people in as many ways as possible. Wow. So then well, Holy Spirit, start, you want to pause? And, yeah, um, let's, let's <laughs> pray for those who, who are just desiring this, this joy, this overcoming presence of the Lord and his bliss and her bliss. I, I feel like there's people who have had like this misconception of who God is and yeah. just pray over all of that and anything the enemy is trying to put in between that that yeah. beautiful union that we have there's never any in between really but but just that feeling that there's something that's dividing or separating you from god that's a lie yeah just cast that out and just just pray i want to just pray and speak joy over people that are struggling with depression because that's the hardest thing and mimi i just i just love you 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 can say and so much on this topic i know for me depression has been something that I feel like every now and then it seems like every six months someone's coming up oh, we need help we need help you know this is a big issue right now and I feel yeah. like it's underemphasized on the news and so I mean I'm not trying to I'm not trying to uh, give the enemy any power here I'm just spe speaking what I'm seeing and what right. the we're seeing and it's really really tragic um so that being said, this, this whole like ecstasy and everything, it doesn't mean that you don't have compassion. Explain how this is service to others, how yeah. this kind of prayer is so important in this hour. Right. You don't mind. Thank and, you. And I agree the whole uh, depression, suicide. We know uh, a young 15 year old that just committed suicide, who's the son of uh, two beautiful people who are ministers in the body of Christ. And um, one of the reasons I wrote this book was because starting in 2012, one of my spiritual sons overdosed on heroin. Then another one of my spiritual sons overdosed on heroin 2015. And I have had so many friends um, who have, and acquaintances who have died of drug overdose. So I asked God, I asked Holy Spirit to teach me how to get the joy of the Lord to as many people as possible in as many ways as possible, because I know that we're not meant to all be the same. And I know that sometimes joy comes to a person through relationship, through supernatural encounters, through art and creativity, through exercise, through music, through, you know, creating a business. There's many, 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 many ways that joy, God's joy, you know, remember in the uh, chariots of fire, the guy that was running said, I feel God's pleasure in me when I run. He felt God's pleasure. That was his, his, his ecstasy, his moment. So I understood early on, not everybody's gonna be rolling on the floor, hammered drunk in the spirit like me. I'm all about it because I was such an addict that God, and I believe we're all wired for pleasure. You know, Eden, the Garden of Eden means voluptuous living and pleasure. Voluptuous, big, fat, overflowing living and pleasure. God created a garden called ecstasy and put a man and a woman in it and said, be, you know, be at peace, be in joy, have dominion, benevolent, loving dominion. So what kind of God is that? who creates a garden called ecstasy and pleasure. Hmm, I think about these things. So then back to the question. And the answer was, well, sometimes I release God's joy through the things that I write. Sometimes I release it through laying hands on people. Sometimes I release it by helping somebody get unstuck from their life and moving on and create a strategy for their business. Sometimes I do it through my music, my cooking, my events. That's just me. So 
in my studies of how do we work, how do we function, how do our bodies physiologically function, how do we function relationally, spiritually, all these different ways. In 2016, January, I'm sitting, I don't know what I'm doing. And all of a sudden inside of me, there was a literal explosion of revelation, ecstasy, and information from my studies of like 20 years. And the phrase binge visioning technique just went boom. And I was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> and Holy Spirit told me, you're going to binge on your life vision. And I'm gonna give you a technique that's portable and shareable that you can pass on to other people, whether they believe or not, it will work for everyone and it will bring the bliss, the bliss of heaven into their life. This is one, this book is one of the, the avenues. So it's just, it's basically a workbook and I'll just, um, I love that about it. I love the layout, you know, my, I did all the pictures, my first, first self-published self book. So if you're thinking of doing it and you think you can't do it, you can do it. You can do it. I did all the photos that are in it too. So I didn't have to, you know, give anybody else credit. In the beginning, there's a testimony of somebody um, from Connecticut who started doing the BVT. That's the nickname for it, the BVT, as soon as I started teaching it. Um, and then there's somebody else in the writing section um, who get, you know, let me publish their testimony. So let me, um, I'm just going to read from the very beginning, yeah. if that's okay. That's the next question. Do you want to read a, read something? Yeah, yeah awesome. All it's right. a prophetic interview. Uh, I'm just going to mute my mic because yeah the storm is still going <laughs> um so it's it's written i mean there's because i'm coming from a believing place and my information and my revelation comes from papa holy spirit and jesus um but there's a bunch of science in here too and i hopefully wrote it in a way where somebody who doesn't yet believe in anything so like i was an atheist I am really hoping that people who don't yet believe in anything, but who have, it's for anybody that wants to connect and create a vision for their life, their personal life, their professional life, their creative life, but then actually see, and then do something with that vision, not just make a vision board, stick it on the wall or write a bunch of affirmations. It's beyond, way beyond all that. Incorporating spiritual principles from scripture, as well as scientific data, like hardcore, you know, evidence. So um, I start off with, for the Lord bestows wisdom and teaches knowledge and understanding. It's from Proverbs 2.6. Um, you know, the Bible says that for a lack of wisdom and understanding, my people diminish, weaken, and fade away. Well, I started flipping that scripture around to the positive years ago, and I say, with a progressively expansive life-sustaining vision, my people thrive, prosper, and become supremely effective. So I flipped the negative. Woo, I just said that out loud and it was like, whoa. Okay, I keep going. <laughs> That's so awesome. So I just write, whether you believe in God or not, the statement above is a promise, a promise that there is one who is willing to give wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to you. To you, whoever's watching, to you as an individual. He cares about you. If you're reading this book, you are actively seeking wisdom or understanding about something. You are probably part of the vast number of people throughout time who have asked two very important questions, questions that I have studied and answered for you in part, by creating the binge visioning technique. And the two questions are, how does life work? And how can I make life work for me? So then I go on to explain that. So there's some, there's some science in here. There's a couple of uh, practice writing sessions. And then the definition of pronoia, which is like what I fully believe, I'll read that to you. This book is based in pronoia, which is the deeply held belief that God, the heavenly beings, 
and the entire cosmos are conspiring together to work on your behalf and shower you with blessings. So people that don't believe in, you know, Trinity, Creator, God, Jesus, Abba, Holy Spirit, we'll just talk about the universe, right, with a capital U. Well, this goes beyond that to the creator of the universe who wants every human being, I believe this, to experience the joy of knowing their union with him. And I'm not sure whether I should go to the other, we should have talked about something before, but we'll talk about it later. Um, some of the terminology that I, I'm starting to use to describe the Trinity that is more in keeping with what I think is true um, regarding Holy Spirit. We can have another interview for that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll do that. The point is, is that um, I believe God loves us so much and that God wants us to not only be awakened to the union that we have when Christ reconciled the cosmos to himself, to God, you know, God, the father reconciled all things to himself in Christ. That's what the word says, not making that up. You could just hang out on that verse for the rest of your life and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, you'd be like, whoa. But God also wants us to know, you know how it says in Ephesians, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're spiritual for the pulling down of strongholds. And that gives the armor and all that stuff. Well, the strongholds are often right here in the brain, in the mind, okay? So we talked, about she, Anissa mentioned brainwashing a few minutes ago. With the binge visioning technique, you are taking control of brainwashing yourself. And what you're doing is with the, the process that I teach you and take you through in the workbook is through writing, speaking, and the way that you write, a specific way to do it of the writing, speaking it, recording it, listening to it, you are actually re, uh, rerouting and reprogramming brain cells and rerouting neural pathways, the little paths in your brain to agree with God's vision and your vision for your life. Now, when that goes back to identity. When you agree with God, I, I heard this a long time ago and I haven't been able to verify it, but I'm just gonna put it out there. I heard the de a true definition of humility a long time ago. And the person said, true humility is having an accurate assessment of oneself. Not too high, but not too low either. So I started taking that and I started coupling it with, well, who does God say I am? Well, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm above only. I'm not below. I'm beloved in the brethren. I'm accepted. I'm wanted. I'm the pearl of great price. It goes on and on and on and on. Well, humility is, in my definition, simply embracing and accepting those definitions of my identity, even if I don't feel them. So instead of arguing with God and saying, no, I suck. I, I, I'm terrible. I lost my temper. I, I drank a bottle of scotch. I cheated on my taxes. I cheated on my wife. I, you know, watched porn before I did my, ser my sermon for tomorrow morning. I'm a horrible human being. And God says something different. True humility, in my definition, is accepting God's truth to displace whatever I believe about myself until I agree with God's truth. The binge visioning technique, it's just a crazy term, but an effective way to take what God is saying about renewing your mind and put it into a fun, uh, healing, revealing kind of a process to help you come to a place. Like if there are any places where you have that, what's called cognitive dissonance, you know, two opposing thoughts that don't agree with one another. And typically a person will hold on to the one that's familiar, even if it's unhealthy or negative. Yeah, we talked about this last week too. Lainey. Really? Yeah, with Lainey. Lainey. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Go ahead. So this process of helping you, you know, because people, I, just in the years of ministry, we can teach people principles and ideas and things from scripture 
But then when they go home, they don't necessarily know how to apply it. So Holy Spirit has helped me create a way to apply these principles and then use them so that you can bring your whole being into a place of agreeing with God. And let me tell you, I know this from, you know, being a baby believer in 1985, as soon as I went, oh my God, I'm a princess, I'm royalty. I'm not this and that and the things that I did to get drugs. I'm not that. I'm who God says I am. When I actually embraced that, everything in my life began to change at an accelerated rate. And the strongholds, the drugs, the mindsets, the relationships, they all started to lose their, um, lose their hold and their power. Not because I wasn't even in a church where they prayed deliverance or inner healing or any of that stuff. But everything that was not benefiting me started to lose its hold and crumble. And my identity in Christ began to uh, displace all that. That was the principle that pastor taught me. He said, Mimi, you can't just stop a behavior without replacing it with something else. It will never work. So just like, uh, you know, you have a glass of water and you pour oil into it and the oil will displace the water. It will push it out. He taught me, you have to put in the truth and that will push out the false. Right. It will displace it. You have to take on some of the healthy behaviors back then it was you know study my bible have regular prayer get together with other believers and it displaced and pushed out new things i have heard this slogan like fake it till you make it well this not faking it right but you might feel like oh but stepping out in faith is another one yeah it, all of a sudden it happens and you're doing it naturally yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's beyond that because you're taking something that's real and truthful. So like, I'm not focusing on stopping doing Coke. I am focusing on diving into the word. And back then it was like living water to me. It really was. There's nothing fake, nothing. I was, I was devouring it from morning till night. I had quit my job. I had a lot of money back then. Okay. So that happened right away for you pretty much. Okay. Not just, it was but it was a process and it can happen for anybody when you just like a science experiment like I, that's why i gave the water example if i have a glass of water and i take a big thing of oil i pour the oil into the glass because oil is lighter or heavier it might be the other way around anyway one will displace the other it will push it out so i'm not focusing on stop the bad behavior stop the bad behavior stop i'm not even thinking about the bad behavior so much i'm bringing into my life the things that are life-giving. God brought into my life the things that were life-giving. And when that happens, it those things became irre irrelevant to me. You're on the solid foundation. <laughs> and just, they were like, it's not my identity anymore. Right. And so the process with the binge visioning technique is it's part of displacing. So any lies people have about themselves, their vision, or maybe their vision's not clear. Yes, yeah. They don't feel worthy. I could testify to that too. That when I'm working on my Psalms 23, um, we were. I was reading your book, and as I was as I was reading, like it was so. I had this mystical moment where where time just it felt like in the spirit that everything just stopped, and I had this yeah. long chunk of time, and I just read, and I was like whoa, I, I've just never experienced that intense. I mean, I know you talk about it all the time, supernatural stopping time or feeling that way anyway, where God just puts you in a place of rest where nothing matters and you're just in it, right? And yeah. I was just in the flow. And all of a sudden, like my whole perspective changed on that issue. And I'm not gonna get into my story, but that one issue that was struggle that I was struggling with and praying about, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know what to pray. Mm -hmm. Started speaking in tongues and it just went away. And I'm not saying tongues was a solution. It was just part of it for me. So 
I can identify. I, lo I love this book. It's great. <laughs> and I talk, I think I mentioned not necessarily like, reference to what, but the eternal now. So yeah, we have a few minutes. So let's wrap it up. Um, okay. I've my daughter's so I have to go yeah. soon, but yeah. we have time. Let's let's um let's definitely uh you know talk about this because this is so important. Let's do like another five if that's okay, Mimi. Okay, on which specifically? Um, whatever you want. We are going to do this again because I feel in the spirit we have to do like a part two. Okay. I know we're only doing an hour, but we could go on and on. This is so yeah. beautiful. Thank you so yeah. much. Oh, I thank you for inviting me. I just I'm glad that it, you know, it's cool. It's yeah. Um so so the binge visioning technique, um, you really have to get the book to, to read through it. Um, I can describe it a little bit, but it's unlike anything that's out there. I've never seen anything like it that puts together these different elements from scripture. There are people that teach manifesting tools, but they leave God out and they leave Holy Spirit out. The other thing I want to mention really just briefly, because I want this to get in the hands of everybody, um, if you know anybody in recovery, recovery groups, prisons, this is, um, I have 35 years of what I call happy sobriety. And um, this book is meant to be kept in your purse, in your glove box. And for somebody in the moment of Jones and for whatever it is that they do that's unhealthy, there's over a hundred things in here that you can do in the moment to redirect your thoughts, change your brain chemistry, and keep distracting you away from the thing, like displacing the thing that's bad for you and to do something that's healthy for you. And it's split into um, the first category is your identity. So things related to your identity. The next section is God stuff. So things related to God for those who believe in God. Um, there's resources to call, then people, things you do to interact with other people. Um, you said things. you were on Kindle, right? Or Audible too? Um, nope, not yet. These not are just yet. paperback. Nope, I haven't. This is my first self-publishing. I just wanted them to be available on, um, you know, paperback right away. It'll take a little time. Okay. Um, it's dedicated to Brad Hamilton, who was um, Judah Harris's son and my spiritual son who passed away, I think 2015. So I want this to get out to many people. I have them, people can order directly from me. I'll just give you the contact for that. Real simple. You can do bvtbook at gmail.com. So binge visioning technique book at gmail.com. Or the other one is the shalom lifestyle at gmail.com. And I check those all the time. So the last couple of minutes. Um, my mission in life is the ecstatic takeover of the entire globe and um, all of humanity to come into this blissful state, peaceful state and experience what I call the shalom lifestyle of knowing who their God is, who their creator is and who they are. And to know the beautiful extreme diversity within that union. I like the way, I think it was Matt Spink said it recently, um, union with distinction. So union with distinction. Thank, where, thank you for mentioning, yeah, the Kainos, I, Kainos, Kainos, he says, he says uh, Kainos, I say Kainos still, but yeah, you could touch on that too, because I forgot to even get there. <laughs> yeah, so I'm out here in Oklahoma City, we're actually hosting them, I'll mention that too, for. Um, Anybody who's interested, we're hosting Matt and Katie Spinks, Lynn Spinks, um, Jill and Martin, they have a long last name from Tennessee and a whole bunch of other people coming on the Milk and Honey Glory Caravan Tour, which is starting in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. But um, out here in Oklahoma City, where I am for about a month working on book three and playing my new Nord, which is over there, creating more sounds, um, they're coming here to this location next Tuesday and Wednesday. So if anybody wants the contact information on that, they can um, message me or you or whatever. Find me on Facebook, Mimi Caban, I'm there and um, we'll send the address to them. So everybody's welcome. But the point is, is that, um, oh my God, just, you know, sadly lately I've been having these chats with people who are believers 
and they're so caught in these religious uh, boxes that they will argue to the death that something about the goodness of God is not true. And they so desperately, whatever, whether it's superstition or indoctrination, I don't know what it is, so many things that are actually the goodness of God, the manifestation of God, they'll attribute to the enemy. And I mean, that happened to Jesus. He was called what the son of Beelzebub or Beelzebub himself, right? So it's not like it's a foreign type of thing, but, and I heard Teresa Griffith say this yesterday. Um, she said, sadly, many choose to go around Mount Sinai again and again and again and again, and only a small group went in to the promised land. I believe we're already in the midst of the promised land in God, in the Trinity. And my passion, my prayer, my desire, the reason I'm writing books, the reasons I've made many choices where I could have gone in directions where I could make a lot more money, but I chose different paths to have my home be open to people, to create, to worship, to facilitate events because I'm passionate to see um, people know their God and to know their belovedness. Because when people know, we know this as parents, when our kids know that they're loved and they are beloved, they'll manifest belovedness. That doesn't mean everything they do is, is exactly perfect. That's not what that means. But over time, I mean, I've looked at the people that my kids have grown up into. My son's almost 24. My daughter's going to be a senior in high school. And the, the reports that other people send to me about them, everybody from a boss at work to their teachers, to family, to strangers, they are so taken by these two human beings who were raised in an atmosphere of belovedness. And that belovedness came from my relationship with Papa and their dads. And he passed away in 2007. But in an atmosphere and a lot of people coming into our world, you know, kind of like aunties and uncles and brothers and sisters in the spirit, with this atmosphere of freedom, belovedness in Christ, creativity, and joy. It's a beautiful way to live and a beautiful way to grow up. And for those like I hear, you know, a lot of people in the free kind of grace streams really criticizing those in the religious streams and vice versa, vice versa. But when I was at the National Day of Prayer last September in Washington, D.C., and I was listening, it was real hard hitting on repentance and the sins of America, and that's not how I role, but I was there because I was supposed to be. And my heart's cry was, Papa, let the United States experience your love to such a degree that they fall in love with you. And then supernaturally, the next day, when I was in David's tent, which is 24 uh, seven worship tent on the National Mall, they have a very set schedule, they have set teams, they don't invite strangers to come up and do anything. It's all set, you know? Well, supernaturally, they came out and they asked me out in the crowd if I wanted to come up and pray with the band. And I said, well, I often sing my prayers and I was really high in the spirit. I didn't really even know what was going on. I thought it was God touching my shoulder, but it was this beautiful girl saying, do you want to come up and pray? And I was like, okay. And I sang the very prayer, my heart's cry the day before that America would fall in love with God. I sang it for a half an hour with this incredible trio of like jazz musicians, wow. just declaring and singing that God is wooing and wooing and wooing. And he is wooing. He wooed me September 8th, 1985. He was wooing me before that date. But that was the date where I went and woke up. 
he had tried before, but it was that day. And when my first husband passed away in 2007, I was very angry with Jesus. Papa God, I was good with Holy Spirit. I was good with but Jesus. I was mad at. And he tricked me into this commitment where I committed to facilitate worship every day at lunchtime for people that were doing a 40 day fast. I wasn't fasting, but I committed to do worship during their lunch break, what would have been their lunch break. And in that process, he wooed me again back into that song of Solomon love affair with him. So that's it. That's what it's all about. That's why I do what I do. I am in love with the creator of the universe who first loved me and Jesus, who is the creator and Ruach HaKodesh, who is God, all Trinity, all God. And they are so in love with all of humanity. And I want every single individual to know that and experience it. And if I have anything to do with it, if I can facilitate that, that's what I'm all about. So just uh, what a beautiful prayer and a great way to end. Thank you guys so much for this sister. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for her kindness. Thank you for her patience working with us. Holy Lord, <laughs> technology can really bug me, but you're always there and you're always there to provide, make a way. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you for your goodness. I just, um, just want to like, just reach your hands out if, if you need prayer and just like, it's not me, it's just Papa in you. Just feel, feel him in your belly. Rivers of living water just flowing mm -hmm. through and in and through you and in and through you. I just pray right now in Jesus name for all people who are struggling, whether it's with, with religion or with spirituality. This is so weird. You're feeling uncomfortable. I just pray that Whatever God wills for you will manifest. Yes. It's, not, it's not my prayer for any specific agenda. It's just our prayer for identity, like means yes. and knowing who we are as this new kainos, kainos, whatever you want to say, new creation in Christ. Thank you so much, Lord. Amen. Whew, I just felt compelled to do that first. <laughs> and now I know we got to go, but do you have any further prayers or thoughts before we go? Yeah, I'll just speak one quick prayer of the Sheheka Yenu, and I might not get the Hebrew all right, but it's one of my favorite blessings. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, Sheheka Yenu, v'kiyamanu, v'higiyanu, lazma hazeh. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe and King of my heart. Thank you for sustaining us, keeping us alive, and bringing us to this kairos moment that we've never experienced before to be able to share it together for the first time and for everybody who's tuning in may you experience the beauty of this um kairos appointed time moment mm. uh, and the blessings of god just pshum, poured out on you <laughs> thank, you. Sure. thank you so much sister all right you, honey well, i we love you have to do this again <laughs> okay i'm all for it yep Thanks, guys. Love you. And Shabbat Shalom. We're heading Shabbat into Shabbat. Shabbat. Shabbat.